Good afternoon. My name is Brooks Fail from the class of 1988, and I have the honor of serving Williams as Director of Alumni Relations. Right. Uh, on behalf of all of us in Williamstown, I offer you a warm welcome, a warm welcome home, and thank you for making the effort to be here this weekend to connect with classmates, friends, and your college. One of the many privileges of my job is to work closely with today's speakers and see firsthand their commitment and dedication to Williams. By way of introduction, let me say a little bit about both. Tom Gardner, class of 1979, is not only here celebrating his 40th reunion, but is also our president of the Society of Alumni. That's a role that Tom has held this past year and will do so until this time next year. Tom's dedication to Williams is equaled by some, but surpassed by none. He is motivated by the desire to keep fellow Eves connected to each other and their college. Tom has interacted with countless members of the Williams family and is an open sounding board and positive advocate for all. We've all been the beneficiary of his efforts. Please join me in welcoming and thanking Tom. It is my pleasure to introduce the 18th president of Williams, Maud S. Mandel. Maud's reputation as a leader in higher education precedes her current role. A graduate of Oberlin College and the University of Michigan, she built an exceptional legacy over the past two decades at Brown University, having served on the faculty since 2001 and later as dean of the college. An accomplished historian, President Mandel has examined how policies and practices of inclusion and exclusion in 20th century France have affected ethnic and religious minorities, most notably Jews, Armenians, and Muslim North Africans. In addition to her leadership role, President Mandel holds the title of Professor of History. Joining Maud in the transition to Williamstown are her husband, Steve Simon, here in the second row, and their children, yep, Steve. and their children, Lev and Ava. Please join me in welcoming President Maud S. Mandel. Before turning the stage over to Maud and Tom, we thought we'd offer a reminder of why we're all here. Just five days ago, we welcomed the class of 2019 to the alumni ranks. Here are some of the sights and sounds from this year's commencement. So that kind of reminds you what it's all about. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's so great to see you here. Nice to have a room full of EFS alumni, family, and friends. 
Um, this should be a good afternoon. Those of you who did not sell your tickets on StubHub should be rewarded by this. So. <laughs> Uh, very happy to have you here. So the format for this is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, Maud and I are going to have a chat for about 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll turn it over to you for 15, 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. Um, if you ever see me looking at my cell phone, it's not because I'm addicted to my email or that I'm incredibly rude. It's just because I'm trying to keep track of the time here, so we make sure that Maud and I just don't keep talking till midnight and forget about uh, the audience participation piece of this. So, Maud, hello. Hello. <laughs> so. Uh, you were actually on this stage a year ago in your sort of preview period. Yes. Uh, three weeks after that, on July 1st, you began your tenure. And I guess it's sort of appropriate to look back over the past 49 weeks and say, what has been your biggest surprise about the, the Williams community? What have you discovered about us that you thought you knew but didn't know quite as well? Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. And uh, <laughs> thanks to everyone for, uh, for turning out. Um, so one of the things I, I have been saying quite a bit about my introduction to the Williams community is that uh, one of the things that I expected turned out to also be the, big, the biggest surprise, in a sense. And that is to say that um, one of the things that attracted me to Williams was um, the very entrenched tradition here of uh, student faculty engagement with each other and the deep learning that comes from that student teacher connection. Uh, and I knew that before I came. And of course, uh, as a historian, I'm always really interested in the stories that institutions or people tell about themselves and, and the story that Williams tells about itself that I read long before coming and that you could recite by memory uh, is the story, of course, of Mark Hopkins and the log. Uh, and that's um, a, wonderful, a wonderful story that encapsulates uh, how a community thinks about itself. But the surprise and the thing that was interesting about it was how true that story really has turned out to be. Uh, it, it is structurally true in the seven to one faculty student um, or student faculty ratio, but it's also so true in the day to day interactions here uh, between students and faculty. And seeing that play out over and over uh, over the course of the year um, has just been uh, wonderful. I see it in actually just witnessing the conversations as I move through campus uh, in the way that students report on their satisfactions with levels of uh, engagement with faculty here, which is among the high, the thing that they are most excited about and, and speak most positively about when they're polled about things that they like or are less satisfied with at the college. Faculty are always at the top of that list. Um, and I see it when faculty talk about teaching, uh, when they are, um, uh, reviewed for tenure and promotion, the way they talk about their expectations of, of each other and, and, ha and how they talk about their experiences with students. And when I went at my very first summer here la a year ago, I spent a lot of the summer going um, to meet with chairs in offices one by one to hear about their departments and their research and their teaching. Uh, and it was quite noteworthy how many faculty used that time with me to tell me uh, about how much they loved working with Williams students. So that, uh, that, that story uh, that Williams tells about itself is true. And, and hearing that over and over and seeing it over and over was a powerful confirmation of that um, and the most pleasant surprise upon, upon arriving. The other one I, I often like to talk about, and it's quite appropriate, I think, in this audience, is um, uh, the power of, uh, of the alumni connection to this school. Several people here, several people here today have said to me, um, Welcome to the cult. <laughs> this is why I'm walking around. That's just in passing, sort of, hi, Maud. Hope it's going well. Welcome to the cult. Um, and the thing is that um, I have just, I have been so moved by the engagement of alumni with this institution. I've spent quite a, a, a lot of time here on campus talking to alumni, but also now out on the road. Um, and you may, I don't know, but you may take for granted the degree to which alumni are engaged with uh, this institution. But um, for me, it was shocking, actually. And I was particularly, note, it was particularly noteworthy to me um, in this campaign that we're about to close, which. Uh, I inherited and in which I came in to see these statistics of uh, hopes of 75% um, uh, contribution hopes and 85% engagement rates, which were, were really based around the notion that uh, somebody would engage in some way, either through contributing to the campaign or volunteering or attending um, events or teaching a winter study course. And I saw that figure of 85% and thought it was, um, you know, 
outrageously ambitious. I was really surprised. Um, but um, imagine my surprise to learn that within a couple of weeks of my arriving here, um, a year before the end of the campaign, we had actually exceeded the 85% engagement goal. And, and I, you know, I always pause when I say that statistic to say, that's 85% of living alumni. <laughs> that's incredible. No school <laughs> does that. Uh, and, and so see, that's a number, but seeing that play out over and over again in conversations with alumni uh, 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 across the year um, has just been um, a, a wonderful, pleasant surprise. Uh, as, as part of my uh, onboarding onto the institution. Our, our new goal is actually 101% engagement. Then. We're, we're, Excellent, we we're going to make bar. it, uh, I have it, no doubt. Well, yeah, what do they say? Aim high, you know? So, okay, good. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. So, uh, one of the things that you've done, and you initiated it fairly early in the process, in your, in your tenure, and maybe a little surprisingly, was to kick off this strategic planning process that we're hearing about. So, why don't you, uh, what, what are you trying to accomplish with this, and, uh, and where are we in this process at this point? Um, thank you. Uh, so yes, strategic planning, I, I arrived on campus uh, very excited to do and wanted to waste no time in getting started. And that was precisely because, not because I thought, oh dear, Williams has broken things we need to fix and I better get at it. Um, it was really much more about um, what I see to be the role of an institution for higher education uh, and the really responsibility and importance of consistently every 10 to 15 years asking itself the hard question, are we doing the very best that we can do with, the, uh, with our, what is in fact our core mission, which is educating students? And the simple answer, of course, is we are doing a very good job. We know that in so many ways. There's so many assessment uh, levels that we can use to, to prove that. And yet it is really crucial to understand that the world that our students are graduating into uh, is an evolving world and therefore, it is important that curriculum evolves, that faculty evolves, that uh, they reach their highest um, uh, research agendas and that we can support them to do that. Um, the very nature of what is staff in higher education is changing and we want to be very attuned to making sure that staff are equipped to reach their highest uh, ambitions in working with students and supporting the work of the college and their own professional development. Uh, we want to make sure that um, that our, our infrastructure is up to the challenges uh, of the, the next 10 to 15 years. So the goal was really to not waste a minute to getting down to that, answering that question question. Um, having said that, we are an institution of higher education, which means we don't move like cor the corporate world, which usually you launch a strategic planning process and three weeks later you have a strategic <laughs> plan. You asked, where are we in the process? This is a two-year process here. Uh, we spent the first year, I like to say planning for planning, um, in which we uh, created the working groups um, that are going to be focusing on the eight key areas that I think uh, we need to be engaged with, which are um, student learning uh, inside the classroom is one of the groups. Uh, we also have a group working on student learning outside the classroom, which is uh, a very big part these days of higher education focus. We used to call what students did outside the classroom the extracurriculum, and campus had paid virtually no attention to them. We now call them the co-curriculum. Uh, and very often, you may be among them, students will say, I learned as much outside the classroom as inside the classroom when I was in college. And I, I've, I've paused to reflect on the fact that people say that, and I've wondered a little bit, well, who's teaching that curriculum? <laughs> and how do we know they're learning what we want them to learn? And I'm not actually proposing that we treat the co-curriculum the way we teach the curriculum, and in fact, the way we do it um, in, in a, a very different kind of way. And in fact, that is a place where staff are hugely invested and do a lot of wonderful work. Um, but I am interested in asking the question, what is our goal for the co-curriculum? And how do we know if we're achieving it or not? Um, and, and being a little more intentional about that. Uh, we're also looking at the built environment. We're looking at our sustainability um, in investments. We're looking at uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity as one of the key uh, priorities for the next 10 to 15 years to make sure that we make Williams a place where everybody uh, who calls it home really feels like they're thriving. Uh, we have a committee on Williams in the world, which is really about thinking primarily, it's it's got a big name and it will focus on Williams in a global context, but I'm also very interested in Williams in the Northern Berkshires and the way in which we in interact and engage with our educational partners, our community partners, uh, and, and how we can t um, best both uh, contribute to, but also 
um, we, consist we consistently benefit from uh, partners in our surrounding community. So we want to think very carefully about whether uh, we're doing that to the best of our ability. Um, and, uh, and we have a committee working on governance as well and thinking about the way in which the institution is governed. I think I, think I got all of them. I hope I didn't leave anybody out. Um, and <clears throat> as for where we are in the process, those groups have charges. Uh, we're spending the summer doing a lot of data gathering from peer institutions and from our own institutions so we can position those um, working groups to be uh, in good stead for, for uh, good work in the fall, and they will spend the fall uh, investigating their charges, uh, writing reports, and then in the spring we'll write a strategic plan for Williams. Um, and you all have gotten just probably more letters from me already than you want about this, but there's a lot of opportunities for alumni to send feedback through an online portal. Um, and we're going to constantly be updating. Right now we have the charges there, and you can take a look at them if you're interested. Um, and as more material becomes available, we'll, we'll make that uh, accessible and people can send feedback. We're also having a phone cast with alumni where we can um, get, get some feedback uh, on various parts of the plan as it's evolving as well. Uh, fantastic. Great. So um, I guess it's fair to say this has been an interesting first year for you. That's kind of a polite word. I, uh, other words that come to mind might be challenging and at times even, even difficult. Uh, so what's your perspective on what's going on, sort of a macro view of this, and, and how have you handled all of these issues that have come out, which have been largely student generated uh, day after day, it seems? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, yeah, it's been um, it's been a lively semester. Uh, there's been a lot of um, student activism, a, a lot of uh, campus uh, debate around big issues uh, of our times. Um, one of the things that is very clear to me, having come from another institution in higher education, and also following very closely the news on these issues across higher education um, is the degree to which the conversations we were having at Williams this spring is part of a larger campus conversation that's happening across the country right now. Um, so you asked about the macro level. There's really nothing that happened at Williams this semester that isn't uh, also happening in lots of other places. And in fact, one of the things that really struck me is that when I was at my former institution, um, Every, every year we would have one really big meaty issue that, that the campus would really get engaged and um, focused on. So we had a year where we uh, really were very deeply enmeshed in Title IX issues, and then we had a year where we were really deeply enmeshed in issues around race and racism, um, and another year where we were uh, really um, <coughs> uh, engaged around free speech issues. This year, uh, after I'd left, there was a, a big referendum there around uh, Palestine and Israel. Uh, Williams did all of those in one semester <laughs> this year, um, and and I say that actually I know every I know you're laughing and I'm laughing too. I of course I'm saying it lightly, but I don't mean to make light of these issues. These are these are issues that our students are passionate about. Um, I think we were a little later to come to some of these conversations than some other campuses, but the passion that uh, has been voiced here is equivalent to that going on in other places. Um, and, and it's important that we talk about these, these matters. Um, it is, of course, there are times when I wish we talked about them in different ways. Um, when you talk about the challenges, of course, you know, there's, there are moments where um, it has been very difficult. Um, but we shouldn't be surprised that when you're talking about difficult issues, the conversation sometimes gets difficult. And I think that is, that is the one message I want to get out there. And I often say that if activists um, didn't make you uncomfortable, they wouldn't be activists. They wouldn't be doing their jobs. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a particularly uh, useful intervention if we all just nodded and smiled and said, oh, yes, I agree with that, right? Then it wouldn't be activism. It would be something else. Um, and so I think there is, uh, there's a way in which the, the, the method of raising the issues gets people upset, and then when they're upset is when we start talking about the issues. Otherwise, we're not. Um, and that, that happened here a lot. Um, we started early in the semester. I, we actually started last semester, but, um, but this semester was particularly intense. So a activism, of course, is not new to college campuses. It's not new to Williams College. You're looking at members of our 50th reunion class, class of 69, is heavily represented out there. And they, they took over your office about 50 years ago. And, yes, thank and you, you for that. You, you were spared that particular issue, although you probably would have welcomed it with open arms. Um, <laughs> well, let's not exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> Lest okay, anybody out up. there is listening and streaming. <laughs> this is not being live streamed, I'll have you know. Um, 
But, but how, how is activism different in this day and age than, than it has over the generations that are represented in this room? So that's a great question. And actually, it is true that most of the tools in, in the toolkit of activism are actually 50 years old or older, actually. Uh, um, but, uh, but certainly has been true for decades now on campuses. Um, Really what's different now is uh, the impact of social media on our campuses. And I think really the way that plays out and how I've noticed it so strongly in my old former institution, but very intensely here, is that the things that happen on campus now uh, don't stay on campus. It used to be that there would be much unrest, uh, really over the decades you can come up, I'm sure many of you if I, if I pass the mic could come up with something that was going on on your campus, maybe in a different way, of course a different issue, uh, maybe in retrospect it, lo it looks like something you're more comfortable with than what's happening now, that doesn't surprise me though, it's again it's historical, it's easier to sort of forgive the past than, than the present. Um, but. But what was certainly true is what happened on campus basically stayed on campus. And now what's happening is that either the individuals themselves are making the work that they're doing public or other people are making what they're doing public. And, and suddenly we are, as we were this year in the Wall Street Journal, on Fox News, you know, we, we and, and of course it's Williams, we have a name. So people are interested when they hear that something's going on here about talking, talking about it off campus. And then of course the people who are most um, interested and challenged by what they're hearing are Williams alumni who read about that. Um, and so the social media is having the impact of elevating one percentage, or no, not one percentage, but one part of what's happening here on campus and erasing everything else that's happening on campus. So that it's not that it's not real. It's real and intense and when it is and important. Um, but it's also not everybody, and it's not the only thing that's going on. And, and it's much harder, actually, to get those other stories elevated. For example, just to give you one that is my favorite, the fact that Williams was the number one winner of Fulbright Awards in the country for a liberal arts college this year. That was really exciting and hey. wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> right? That's good news. <laughs> Fox News didn't report that. <laughs> <laughs> they should. <laughs> That's good news. Right. Right. But it's not like new, it's like news in general, right? That's not what really makes what makes it out are the things that are challenging and upsetting and right. And that that's how media works. And and but it, if you ask specifically what is different, I think that is uh, that is something to take note of. That it's it's actually a little bit less um, what's happening and more what you hear about it that becomes, right. the, the, becomes the really distinctive difference, which is not to say the issues of the day are identical to the issues of the past. Those change over time. Well, may, maybe you could pick one of the issues of the day. Uh, <laughs> there's so many to pick from, I guess. It's free speech or Wi-Fi, uh, uh, Asian American studies. So maybe you could give a mini case study on sort of uh, how, how you handled it as it came up. Well, actually, um, I, 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 now I want to talk about all of those because you asked. So, so maybe I'll just. Well, I, I have been point. told that it's hard to separate them out because yeah, they, they yeah. all sort of spring from uh, different shades of, it, right. of the same place. So I'm not, I don't want to assume that everybody in the audience knows the same level about each in, sort of. And, and in fact, while it is true that social media has promoted and media has promoted out much of what's happening, it, it may be that you've missed some of it. So I don't want to necessarily. Um, take our time to dwell in details of everything, but I, I will answer just maybe uh, two case studies there just that you made reference to as, as a way to to talk about how um, how these things can work. So the first, when I arrived here last spring, I'm first talk about the um, push among students for a focus in Asian American studies, which uh, was actually really an, an issue that was already, well, it's been, as I understand it, uh, uh, the push for this actually has been going on for a very long time. Um, I came in very late in the game on this. Uh, and But already when I arrived last spring, uh, at my Chapin Hall introductory event, student activists were coming up to me at the reception and presenting me actually at the at the reception with a list of demands that that was I had a piece of paper yeah. with <laughs> demands on it that were not just to me but you know why not <laughs> was, um, and uh, and largely around um, calling for the formation of a program of study in this area and what they were told before I got here was um, that that. It, it, 
we shouldn't pursue a process, that that is what colleges and universities do and presented with an important issue that uh, that is worthy of consideration. And this was certainly worthy of consideration. And, uh, and so that's exactly what happened this semester. One of our campus um, academic committees uh, charged a, a subcommittee with investigating um, <clears throat> the issue of whether Asian American studies would be a valuable uh, addition to the curriculum here. Um, and they made a, a set of proposals which actually didn't start at the level of a program, but started with the hiring of faculty to begin uh, to continue to build up our offerings in this area and potentially moving forward in that direction. Uh, and, and then subsequently, uh, a couple of departments put forward requests for lines in that area, and um, one was approved for next year. So there will be a search for a, an Asian Amer a senior Asian Americanist in American Studies. And, um, and then subsequently a second um, for the year after uh, in religious studies at the junior level um, with the goal ultimately of if it makes sense and if those scholars want to put forward uh, the notion of a program going forward that we can, we can head in that direction. And that's really an example where student activists who were pushing an issue with lots of support, lots of support from other students, faculty, staff, alumni uh, who made a case for why this was an important addition to the Williams curriculum, um, really partnered with people on campus who didn't know much about the issue and were open, approached it with a open, from a, a position of open inquiry and, and moved the campus forward in that way. Um, and that's where we are in that issue. Uh, on the issue of, um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll sort of maybe collapse two of the issues you raised yeah. together, uh, the issue of um, free inquiry and expression and, uh, and then um, the most recent controversies around Wi-Fi. So some of you may be aware that a couple of weeks ago, uh, some students put forward in the College Council a proposal to found an organization here, um, which was in essence a, a pro-Zionist or an organization to support the state of Israel called here called Wi-Fi, which is um, uh, an acronym for Williams for Israel, do I have that right? Yeah, right. And um, so uh, so they put that forward um, and there was a, a debate in the College Council over two sessions um, and a number of students who uh, did not want to um, have that organization represented on campus came and made a case against it. Uh, and ultimately the College Council took a vote and voted 13 uh, to 8 um, not to recognize the group as a registered student organization on campus. Um, so 8 voted in favor, 13 against, 1 abstained. Uh, and um, my view on this issue was that uh, if you read the bylaws of the College Council, they were pretty clear that um, the College Council should recognize groups based on a few criteria. One was uh, whether there was redundancy in the group for uh, a group that already existed on campus, but Williams didn't have such a group. Or, or secondarily, um, if there was uh, sufficient student interest. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that is not the criteria that the voter body used to make this determination. And so um, as a result, the college used an alternative rule in the student handbook for registering students student organizations, which, um, which we put in place. And so now Wi-Fi is a registered student organization on campus. Um, but, the, but that particular issue touched on issues of freedom of association and also issues of free expression on campus. Um, the, the students who were opposing it didn't see it that way. They didn't see it as an issue of free expression. Um, but the, definitely the, the question came up about sort of who on campus has uh, the right to a voice to express themselves. And this, as many people here know, has become a huge issue across campuses more generally. Uh, we're all um, struggling which, with what I would consider characterized as a generational shift in some ways, although not everybody in a generation feels a certain way about it, but a generational shift in how we think about um, who should, some of you have heard me say before, who should have a, a platform and a microphone uh, and a stipend at a college, um, who should be able to um, express their views. And you know, it is quite important that a learning environment uh, welcome a broad range of perspectives uh, and um, groups into its midst. Uh, the the spe specific issue around Wi-Fi uh, for me was also though very much about the fact that uh, members of the Williams community should have the ability to um, organize the way they want to uh, and that this was less about 
an issue of sort of who gets to speak and more an issue about once you are a member of this community, uh, you have a right to organize as you as you want, and um, we can't really stand in the way of it. It's a, it is a basic matter of fairness. Right, right. Yeah. So, uh, as I've watched you deal with these issues and gotten closer to the campus myself in the last year, I've sort of been struck at what a different environment this is from from my career, which was in business, and you can't process these issues in quite the same way. So maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of leadership in, in, in higher ed and, and your own leadership style as you practice it in, in, in this position. Uh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Higher ed is really different than the business world. Um, really? And, uh, and it is uh, notable. Um, how how important it is. And I, I some of you heard me say this morning. I usually I will often compare a college or university more to municipal government than to uh, the corporate or or business world, um, and that's because uh, the the cacophony of voices in a, a community like this um, have more power in a sense, more ability to um, evoke change and to promote. Um, their perspectives. And you will know, and this is a good thing, uh, that we have a tremendous diversity of viewpoints represented on ca campus and in the alumni community and in the parent community and in the faculty and staff. And every single one of them has my email address. <laughs> <laughs> and uses it liberally. Uh, and so, in, in terms of specifically speaking to your question, it, I think it is um, tremendously important, particularly in a learning community where everybody is, in fact, not only uh, very opinionated, but also very smart, uh, to provide opportunities for folks to weigh in on the matters that, um, on the issues that matter to them, um, and to pr provide opportunities for consensus building uh, and moving a community forward on often very difficult and contentious issues. We're not all going to come to consensus about these issues, but providing an opportunity for people to speak and be heard, and for what it's worth, trying to stop people from speaking is very difficult <laughs> anyway, um, and can never be the goal. So, so providing opportunities uh, to engage with and allow people to share their views and be part of a process, uh, and ultimately, if not always agreeing with the direction of what we do, at least understanding why it happened um, and who had a voice in that process. And that's really been what I've been trying to foster here. Um, I, I have been um, trying very actively to be uh, available to the community and open to the community in as many ways as possible. So some of you know I have lunch in the dining halls every other week and I have open office hours for students. Um, I, I do a lot of community engagement work. Uh, Steve and I do a just huge number of events at our home trying to get different constituencies, uh, faculty dinners, staff events. We try to come up with events that mix constituencies together as well. And um, this isn't, it, it sounds like a lot of partying and there's, a, <laughs> there's some fun in it, but it really is part of the answer to your question around um, how, how to bring people together right. in a diverse community like this uh, and, and make it feel like we're, we're all walking in the same direction, even when we have divergent points of views on lots of things. I am full of admiration. It's, it seems like a, a, quite a balancing act. Um, when, whenever I have the opportunity to ask a question of, of Williams President, your, your predecessors included, uh, I, I always try to structure it around a topic that doesn't seem to get too much attention. Academics. Um, <laughs> So Thank I thought you. I'd ask a question about academics. Uh, tell me, in your first year at Williams, what are you, what are you excited about in the, in the academic side, the curriculum, the faculty, uh, something related to our core mission? Thank you. It That's seems a like great we question. talk about everything but that. Um, so um, so the, the, this is a great question. And the truth is, this is such a dynamic intellectual community. That has been really exciting. So I mentioned the Fulbright point already, but I'll just say it again. We won the largest number of Fulbrights <laughs> in the country for liberal arts college. That's awesome. so. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just toss out there that uh, Brown is the largest university winner of Fulbrights for the last three years running, so it's all me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, but, but one of the things that's really exciting about Williams to me is that we have, this is a teaching focused institution that's deeply engaged, as I've already said, with undergrads, and yet, it is a research active faculty. And, that's a, and that is largely due to the tremendous ability that we have, have here to support faculty in this work. So um, we are able to help faculty, even though they have chosen not to spend their lives at an R1 institution, really do the work they want to do on a national and international um, landscape. 
around research. Uh, and then, to make matters even better, they incorporate undergraduates into that work. So there are hundreds of undergrad, and many of you know this, but there are hundreds of undergraduates here in the summer working one-on-one -on -one or several with one faculty member in labs. Primarily it's in the sciences, but not only, and in fact we have been growing over uh, the last few years the number who are able to do this kind of research with in the humanities and social sciences and arts as well. Um, but uh, so, so we have a research active faculty, but one that is deeply committed to engaging students in that work. And for me, that piece of it, that little piece, I just want to dwell on it for a moment, is so important because when last year when I was here, I talked a lot about the, uh, what students take away in a liberal arts education, the transferable competencies that are embedded in a liberal arts education. And one of them, there are many, but one of them is research. And you know, I cannot, how many of you are engaged in a professional activity that requires no research as part of the work? <laughs> Great. It's good you went to an excellent liberal arts education <laughs> school. Right. So everybody needs to know how to do research uh, in order to do the work that they have to do. And in fact, even more so, I think, as time goes on, we're more sort of independently charged to do research in order to get our work done. And so, and it doesn't matter what you research, actually. T you learn the skill of researching no matter what research activity you're engaged in. So to have students working with research active faculty to learn what it takes to be an expert in something, what it takes to really know something, how deep you have to go to write one footnote, that kind of, that kind of lesson, um, and then actually charging students to be engaged in that work is so powerful, and Williams is so good at doing that. So you know we have faculty doing all kinds of wonderful things. We have um, Chad Topaz, for example, in the uh, Applied Mathematics Department who's using applied mathematics to study museum collections. So he's you know, in a collaborative project with other scholars from other dis disciplines. So you have this great kind of interdisciplinary projects. We have um, faculty walking, working in, interdisciplinary but inside of, of the sciences. So for example, uh, Joan Edwards, a senior faculty member in biology, pairing up with Kate Jensen in physics, working on plant reproduction uh, and um, developing findings in, that are both relevant and important in biology and in physics, and again, folding students into that work. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's endlessly vital here. Uh, and, um, and for me, that has been, I won't say the surprise, because I expected that. Yeah. So that wasn't my answer to your first question, but it's been one of the great, great um, confirmations of what I thought I would find here in Williams, and it has been true. So uh, before we turn it over to the audience, I thought that it would be appropriate to say, how, how have you taken your transition to the uh, northwest corner of Massachusetts? Uh, you and Steve, how are you finding uh, life in Williamstown, and, and how has that gone? How's it going? <laughs> 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 I think uh, I think we've we've been so happy here. Thank you. I mean, it, it is first of all we live in that really nice house. I guess it's over that way. Um, so that's been uh, a step up. Um, <laughs> um, we uh, we came, of course, with, well, our son is just finishing his first year in college, so he left very quickly, but our daughter's here with us, and she's just finishing her first year in the high school um, and has a, had a really good year there, uh, which uh, has been wonderful. Folks have been so kind to us. I think um, Steve said to me the other day, if I can say, uh, when we were out taking one of our walks. You all, you all know we walk around a lot. Um, so we're, uh, we're late night walkers here. We, we encountered a bear one day. So that kept us a little closer to home. Uh, yesterday we encountered a snake actually and we both jumped very, very Soon far a cow, and fast. I assume. Yeah, it was, it was a, a kind of scary looking snake. So anyway, but, um, but Steve said to me the other day, you know, this, this feels like our community now. And I think it feels like our community, that wasn't a given. We spent 20 years in another place. We have deep friendships there. There, you know, going back over time, I always say I grew up. I, I grew up at Brown, um, in intellectually and and personally in many ways. Um, but uh, but it's because of how welcoming people have been, and uh, and we really are grateful for that. Um, and it's been a nice soft landing. Great. Okay. So at this point, we're going to 
turn it over to you. Uh, just a, a couple of ground rules around the, the Q&A. Uh, the first is when you ask a question, um, please stand, uh, say who you are, what, what class you're in. That would be uh, very helpful. Uh, and, and the second is, you know, on Jeopardy, they say please uh, put your answer in the form of a question. Here we'd prefer if you put your question in the form of a question. Uh, <laughs> and that is uh, uh, obviously a slight reference to speechifying before asking the question. So uh, uh, please keep it brief. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, Brooks is going to help me because the Klieg lights are a little much. So at this point, do we have any, any questions for Maud? Let's go. Beer in the beer? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mike Hand. I'm part of the 50-year class. All right. Round of applause. From the perspective of uh, half a century, a lot of things come to mind. Uh, it's been interesting to see how many of my classmates in very diverse professions were influenced by uh, some of the same group of giant professors, and I imagine every graduating class have people they look back on the same way. But in our group, it was uh, uh, a number of art professors that hugely influenced the uh, museum administration profession around the country, and I think were part of uh, spreading the reputation of Williams. And I'm wondering uh, how the college goes about identifying, holding, and then promoting folks like uh, Bill Pearson, uh, Lane Faison, and Whitney Stoddard for future generations of Williams. Right. Did, did everyone hear that one? Was that a no? <laughs> Okay. okay. So just just quickly, uh, how do we how can we rebuild the faculty, uh, the giants of the faculty, mm -hmm. and how do we support them to get there? Um, I, thanks for that question. Actually, I was really struck. I went to the um, I think it was the 50th uh, reunion panel today, and I was very struck to, and I am over and over here to hear um, Williams alumni talk about specific faculty members actual things they learned in class. <laughs> it's like, I mean, we do a fair bit of education in higher education about higher education. And one of the things I can tell you we know is that most people forget most things they learn in their classes. And most people even forget what classes they took. It's not, right? In fact, and that's partly why, this is a side note, but why I often talk about the, it's actually those transferable competencies that get transmitted through the content. You actually f often forget the content. Williams alumni often don't forget the content, and it's really, I think, speaks to the power of some of the uh, faculty and, and um, the engagement that took place and, ha and, continu and continues to take place here uh, over so many generations. Um, Williams is undergoing a tr tremendous transformation uh, at the moment because about a third of the faculty is retiring over a 10-year period. And so your question is, is would be important no matter what, but it's very timely because we have a, such a, um, a growth in the junior ranks at the moment uh, and a real sort of passing out of some of the folks who've been here for, we just celebrated the retirement of two physics professors who'd been here for 40 years, for example, right? So these are these are whole careers, hugely influential, and just countless numbers of students. Um, and so, uh, so I, I think the answer to your question is twofold. The first is um, really the great news about hiring at Williams. Williams basically always gets at first choice candidates. And that's, you know, a testament again to um, how great it is to be here, right? right? So, so this is a school that is able to track top-notch candidates and we're able to hire the ones that we want from, from those groups. Um, and, uh, and that's just consistently true. There are fields that are highly competitive right now, like computer science uh, and others where, you know, the work of hiring is harder because we're, we're really competing not just with higher ed, but off, outside of higher ed. Um, but overwhelmingly, we, we uh, are able to attract uh, the very best applicants that are out there in any given search uh, in a particular moment. Um, and, uh, and then what is really important, and it's going back to my answer about being a research active faculty, is thanks, frankly, to the tremendous support of Williams alumni, we are able to support faculty in reaching their research aims, right? So we have um, a competitive sabbatical policy with uh, my former institution with all of the top tier schools that are committed deeply to research. And the result is that our faculty can also pursue 
uh, the research projects that they would pursue if they were at another school. The in teaching engagement here is heavier, not necessarily the number of courses. That's that actually is also competitive. Um, but again, the 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 student faculty bond here is intense, and faculty give a lot to that. Um, so so that works hand in hand with a research agenda for a faculty person to achieve their goals, which which usually are on both are necessarily on both of those scores. Um, but the result of being able to really invest in research here means that we are able to tenure faculty with um, profiles that in most cases uh, are competitive with schools of similar caliber um, but that think of themselves as research universities so um, that's not always true but it is very very often true and it is um, it is an important goal I think to, to keep helping faculty uh, do that as much as possible because and the reason it's so important I'll just goes back to the point about research right because we are we are modeling for students what it takes to be an expert in something. We're not teaching students to be an expert in anything. You don't take 10 courses in something and become an expert. Um, hopefully what you do is take 10 courses and realize how little you know about that subject. <laughs> That's really the goal. Um, but the person who's teaching you is an expert in that subject. And we need to do everything we can to make sure that they're at the top of their profession so that they can model what it, would, what it takes to really do that kind of work. <coughs> Out top there. Hi, I'm Christine Harrington, class of 1984, um, our 35th year. Yeah. Um, my question is about uh, admissions access. Um, it's something that I think about a lot. I think one of the reasons Williams is a cult is because so much, at least for me and I think for many people I know, of our personal and professional well-being, we can trace back to the four years in this little town. Um, and so it's very important to me uh, that as many students who are uh, uh, qualified can make their way to it. And one of the things that's been in the news, I'm not saying in the way that it's been in the news, it is going on here, but I've been concerned for a long time about how uh, uh, legacies and wealth uh, um, interact with the admissions process. And I've been convinced over time that no one who isn't qualified uh, uh, gets in for those reasons. But I've never really got a clear picture on the logic and probably the financial logic behind those practices. Um, and I wonder whether that's anything that the college is looking at, particularly, and I've heard you talk about the need to bring more middle class kids into the, into the environment. Um, I wonder whether you know, you could anonymize a, a past admissions process and see what would happen if you didn't take any of those factors into account. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, did everybody hear the question about admissions? No. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll go for it. Uh, so it's a question, essentially, if I can paraphrase about making it, the admission, sort of talking a little bit about the transparency around admissions and what would happen if uh, we, in a, I think what you said was, uh, uh, maybe what you're implying is a lottery system, which some people have talked about, is that? No, well, no, no, what I'm asking is, uh, there, there is an acknowledged, um, uh, in the admissions process, I know that development uh, prospects and legacies, there's, a, there's a, an extra look, maybe. Okay. And, um, and I'm wondering, um, and I understand that no one gets in who shouldn't get in, you know, who isn't right. qualified. But I'm wondering, uh, I've, I've, I've never really gotten a clear picture of the logic behind those. Okay. So a question about, essentially about foot on the pedal, what happens in admissions and how is it decided? Uh, who gets preference and, and who access, doesn't? And access. And access, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. So, um, so uh, just to step back a bit from that question, then I'll come back into it. Uh, you know, admissions um, across higher education has been in the news a lot this year, both from the Harvard case on the one hand, uh, and then the scandals that took place this spring, happily, uh, scandals far away from the sh <laughs> from Williamstown. Um, but, uh, but it means that there's been a, a lot of light shining on admissions, and I think it gets back to the question because um, it has, I think many of us uh, are looking deeply into our admissions processes to make sure first that they're fair and that uh, that we aren't um, we can 
make sure that none of the things that have happened in other places would ever happen here. Um, but also just to always, and I think it's fair to say we're always thinking about admissions uh, and and how we decide who is going to come here and what how how um, <clears throat> to think about all of the qualified people who apply. And I, I think I should say kind of. Um, uh, before going deeper into this is, uh, yes, everybody who comes here is deeply qualified to be here. And actually the hard part of admissions is that people who are qualified to be here are also are not here. In other words, we always have more qualified applicants than we actually have spaces for. That is the nature of the admissions process. Um, and it's why people find it mystifying why somebody gets into this school and not that school, but it is actually, um, in fact, impossible to let in all of the qualified students that are out there. Um, and so by definition, we are building a class um, and thinking about how we can make the most dynamic, um, diverse class that we can that will introduce students to each a, a broad breadth of uh, kinds of people from uh, all kinds of um, backgrounds, but also different kinds of excellence, if you will, right? So, so we want the brilliant scientist sitting next to the astounding musician, sitting next to um, the incredible artist, next to the kid who has invented something, um, you know, in high school <laughs> that that or started a company, and and it is really so the the foot on the pedal. Piece, what I would say is it's it's less actually about that and it's really more about creating a class that has elements of all of those pieces and yes of course we 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 think very much about um, connections of uh, of the people who have have a connection to Williams uh, and think about um, what part of our community they can help enhance as well and they are very very strong so very strong students you know make no mistake um, uh, but that is only but I guess another way of answering the question is in a sense I hope you're hearing this um, in in the way I'm answering the question in a sense everybody has a foot on the pedal and and what I mean is that because when you're trying to craft a class you're trying to think about the different kinds of constituency you can you can bring to the campus in order to make it a rich experience for everybody um, and so in a sense for everyone we're thinking about you know how does that kind of sort of category of person or 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 um, background or or expertise or interest help enhance the community for everybody, um, and and it means that you know there can be variety. The incoming class, I, just to give you a sense of this, the applications for this year uh, were the largest in Williams history. Every year they go up. I, people, I think, think that's a good thing, but it actually is really hard because we're not letting in more students, so our acceptance rate goes down. But uh, and we can be highly selective, and that's good. But it does mean that we have to turn away qualified applicants every year. Um, and uh, and we had, I believe, the largest number of um, international applications we ever we ever had, which means that this year's uh, admit rate to international students went up. Um, we also, and this goes to not really what you asked, but and just going back to thinking about how you craft a class, one of the things I've been really interested in is um, transfer students uh, and increasing somewhat the access of students from community colleges to Williams. So this year we. Had a, we actually had a huge rise in applications from transfer students, uh, and we had an, a, a concomitant rise in admit rate uh, there as well. Um, we admitted five veterans, two of whom were the first two women uh, veterans in Williams history were admitted in this year's class. We're still the transfer. Uh, um, uh, pool isn't fully settled yet. That comes later uh, after the the rest of the class. But we have growth in those areas, um, and again, that helps also speak to the diversity of the community and bringing people in from different life paths uh, who can enhance the learning for everybody. Uh, we have a dialogue going. Hi, uh, Chris. I like how you think, so I want to hear more. About that. Thank you. Uh, my sense, this is kind of embedded in how you're talking, but when faced with complex and difficult situations, you manage to find really good generative questions to ask in order to approach them. And I want to know, how do you do that? <laughs>
Well, that was a plant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was a very nice question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Look, here's what I would say. So the question was, I, I guess, I think you have to repeat that question. <laughs> That's a challenge. Uh, I, I think the question was, how, how do you come up with uh, the, these, this probing, questioning manner that, that uh, seems to get at the heart of the issues? Is that essentially it? People tend to want to get outcomes. Right. And you recognize, in a way, that you get better outcomes when you ask the right questions. And so how do you find the right questions to ask? Right. That's right. okay. Right. I, I, so the question is, how do I figure out what to ask? Um, right. uh, She's yeah. maud. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I really don't know the answer to how I do that. What I will, but what I will say is that I am fascinated by people. I, it is why I do this work, actually. I am, no, I do this work for two reasons. The first reason I do this work is I'm fascinated by people. The second reason I do this work is I think that educating young people to position them to take on the challenges that are inevitably going to face them going forward is um, to have a tremendous impact on the future. So those are the two reasons that I do this work. But I'm going to go back to the fascinated with people part. Because, because I'm fas just constitutionally fascinated with people, I have found the best way to learn about them is to ask them questions. Um, and, uh, and so I think I'm just intrinsically used to asking questions. I think it's pretty much hardwired as, uh, uh, you, you will hear that I'm talking a lot up here and I'm very talkative. I'm sort of loquacious, some have said. Um, but, uh, but I like to listen as much as I like to talk. Um, and, and so asking good questions and disciplinarily, I'm a historian. Um, also, we are sort of trained to ask certain kinds of questions, maybe all academics are. Some of us listen better than others, I would say. But, uh, but for me, listening has has always been a really important part of learning. So figuring out, I don't know that I always ask the right questions. I just ask a lot of questions. And then eventually, the right question emerges, right? So, um, because, and the reason I say that is if I, if I knew the right question to ask in every situation, that would actually already be, in a sense, shaping the answer. Right? If I always, if I, if I knew exactly what I was looking for, in a sense, I wouldn't be listening well, right? So, so maybe I throw a lot of pasta at the wall, right? I, li I ask a lot of questions. And then in that process of listening and talking and engaging with people, um, it helps me figure out what the next and right question to ask is. Thank you. To, Laura, why don't, you, we're, why don't you have the last word? <laughs> Laura Mover, the lawyer, class of 99. Hey. Uh, thank you for being here. My question is, you have been heralded and often introduced as William's first female president. Congratulations. Um, to what extent is that a mantle that you put on and a role that you play? And do you see that as something that is inherent to the way that you lead, or is it external? Thanks. So the question is uh, pointing out that uh, as the first female president of Williams, it's often noted uh, publicly that, that I'm occupying that role. And to what extent is that um, both uh, a mantle that I wear um, and, uh, and how does it in, in, does it in some way affect, I guess, how I govern and think about running the college? Um, <clears throat> so um, I would say uh, I, w I wear the mantle with pride. Um, and the reason I, w and, and there are two reasons I wear it with pride. The first is, um, some of you know this, for, uh, who, if you heard me speak at my induction, but um, I'm the daughter of uh, someone whose professional career was dedicated to studying uh, women in leadership, women in politics. And so, uh, you know, dinner time conversations were about <laughs> women in leadership. <laughs> That's what we talked about. Um, and, uh, and so, so, um, you know, I can't say sitting at those dinner tables, uh, conversations, I thought, ooh, I want to run something. But I, <laughs> but I would say, actually, that what those conversations did was make clear without ever explicitly um, putting it out there as a thesis, 
uh, that there was no reason that I shouldn't, right? That was, that was the ethos of the room, if you will. Um, and so, so in part, I wear the mantle with pride because I feel like that is uh, the legacy that I inherited in some ways from um, somebody recently called my mother my superpower. So somebody, so the, inherit, the, the um, mantle I inherited from, from my superpower. Um, I also uh, wear it with, uh, as a mantle in the sense that um, one of the things I really believe deeply about the diversity and inclusion work that we always talk about is the, very, the importance of modeling for others pathways, right? So one of the reasons, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons it's really important to say that oh, there are women in the room and people of color in the room and different gender and sexualities and nationalities and all the differences one can imagine is that what we're modeling for young, young people is that you could be there too, that you can see yourself there. There's no reason you couldn't imagine yourself there. So that's really important for me as well. Um, and, uh, and I think it, I have gotten no small number of notes from women undergraduates here who more or less said that, right? that, that for them it's just been important as a role model. Uh, and, and again, in that sense, it's been really important to me. Um, whether or not women leaders actually behave differently than male leaders, which I think is embedded in your question, uh, for me remains an interesting question. Um, I, I don't, I'm going to go back to questions for this one. I think it's something my mom and I spent a lot of time talking about. She has strong opinions about it. Um, and uh, my guess is we, we, we vary even more than just whether we're male and female. There are lots of things that shape how we approach leadership. Um, and that's one of them. And it's not insignificant, but uh, it is also not, I, I wouldn't want to call it essentializingly determinative to use really academic words. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> thank you. So uh, before we depart, I just want to say to Maud, thank you so much. I think we are uh, exceptionally uh, uh, pleased to have you aboard. It's just been a pleasure to be working with you this past year. Uh, a wonderful thing. I think the college is in, is in spectacular hands, and I hope all of you have gotten a sense of that over this past hour and over the course of this weekend, because Maud is always around, and there will be other opportunities to hear from Maud this weekend. So thank you all for coming. Please, another round of applause Thanks, for Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.